Well, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us. As Michael said, I'm Kira Epstein. I'm the program coordinator for the New School at Commonweal. And today we welcome Commonweal's Cancer Choices team back to the new school. We're going to talk about aspirin, vitamin D, and melatonin. I'll turn this over to Michael, Lerner, Nancy Hep, and Laura Pohl in a minute. We are recording this conversation and we'll have the produced audio and video files available on the new school uh, and the Cancer Choices websites. You can also find all of our recordings on the new school's SoundCloud, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify feeds. We have another webinar coming up in December with Cancer Choices. Uh, join us Thursday, December 8th for a conversation with Dr. Wayne Jonas and host Michael Lerner will be back. They'll be talking about how whole person care can become part of routine oncology. With that, I will turn things over to Michael. Again, thank you for joining us at the New School of Commonweal. Thank you, Kira. And uh, again, welcome to those of you who are joining us. It's just lovely. Nancy Hepp, Laura Pohl, uh, welcome to you both. Um, we're just delighted to um, be doing this together. Um, just background for some of you who don't know. Um, Nancy, when did we start doing beyond conventional cancer therapies? How many years ago was that? Uh, we launched the first site four years ago in October. That was the launch, right? Yes. But when well, we... we were working on it for two years before that. Yeah. So 2016. That yeah, so six years, right? And six years, and we we estimated the number of hours on the new site at 10,000, is that right? But if we add beyond conventional cancer therapies, another five or 10? Another 10. Another 10. So what you're looking at here is 20,000 hours of work, in large part by Nancy Hepp and Laura Paul and our colleague, Mickey Scheidel, and uh, other wonderful staff people. Uh, but this has been an incredible effort. And what we feel good about uh, as, is that, to our knowledge, Cancer Choices is the best public resource on the web for the most sophisticated, uh, objective, evaluation of the science on herbs and supplements and repurposed drugs and other uh, interventions. Now, Nancy, you're very careful about these things. So have I said that accurately? Yes. Yeah. And Nancy, uh, recently we were delighted that Jeff Weiss and some of our other colleagues did a, an article in which they looked at uh, what was it, six, six or eight of the leading sites and ranked, ranked BCCT, which is our predecessor site, first in terms of evaluations. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Yeah. There were 11 that they, they looked at. 11 sites, which included all the top sites. Yes. But here's the most amazing thing. That was for beyond conventional cancer therapies. And Cancer Choices has taken it a quantum leap beyond that. And I'm not boasting, I'm just telling the truth that no one, to our knowledge, has ever done as thorough, objective evaluation of the uh, scientific literature on herbs and supplements and repurposed drugs and other interventions. So we're just honored to have worked together on this. Uh, it, you know, for me, it's been a, a work of, what is this, over 40 years uh, since my book, Choices and Healing, came out from MIT Press, and Lucy Walesky encouraged us to create a website about it. And then Mickey Scheidel joined us with her immense creative energy. And so it's been a team effort. So I just wanted to say that at the start. So with that, um, Laura, um, let's start with just a sense of 
what's an, what's your overview, your brief overview of uh, uh, the use of supplements and herb supplements and repurposed drugs in cancer? Sure. Thanks, Michael. It's great to be here. Um, by the way, I'm a long-time oncology clinical nurse specialist uh, since 1980, so I've been working with people with serious illness since then and have a, a deep love and respect and um, interest in integrative cancer care, of which supplement use is one of the complementary therapies. So I thought it would be a good idea before we launch into learning about these three supplements we're going to cover today, just to talk about supplements in general. And Michael, I know how you are about stories and the power of stories. So I thought I would tell a little story about someone who um, I've met through the Healing Circles work, um, who was diagnosed with cancer 20 years ago. And uh, he has had multiple surgeries and procedures and other conventional treatment. And he decided to use a number of lifestyle practices and complementary therapies, including natural products and what we call off-label drugs, because we'll be talking about one today, as a matter of fact. And he was, um, he said it was really hard to find reliable sources of information on non-conventional treatment. So he got the help of a medical advocate who is a physician who, in his work, he leaves no stone unturned, basically. And that medical advocate recommended melatonin and the off-label drug uh, metformin. And this person with cancer also studied a couple of books that he thought was really helpful. And from that, he also decided to include some other supplements. Um, and he was most interested. I said, well, why, why were you interested in using them? He said, well, he wanted to prevent recurrence and he especially wanted compounds that would optimize his immune system and or disrupt the me mechanisms of cancer that was were described in these books that he used. And he had to tell his oncologist about his plan to use supplements and off-label drugs because his oncologist had to write the prescription for the metformin. But in general, he said he didn't really want to talk about it, the supplement use with the majority of people on his treatment team because he thought that would just confuse the issue and that they really didn't have much knowledge about supplements at all. So he said the main side effect of taking all these supplements was a shrinking wallet. Mm -hmm. And um, and I asked him, well, do you think the supplements are one of the reasons why you're doing so well this many years later? And this guy is so honest and practical. And he, he wouldn't say that, but he said, I do know that taking them made me feel like I was doing all that I could, and I'm sure that was a positive. So he's an example of somebody who had to advocate for himself, do a lot of the research, find the resources. I've worked with other people who have taken everything but the kitchen sink, and one of my jobs was to sort of help narrow it down to the ones that are likely to be effective and safe, and I had to call in a lot of help to do that. And I've worked with people who use supplements to manage their side effects. In fact, one woman said she'd have quit chemotherapy had it not been for working with a naturopathic oncologist who helped her come up with supplements that eased her side effects. So this conglomeration of, of people I've worked with give me some key takeaways like Conventional medicine doctors in general don't have knowledge and experiment, experience in using natural products. And I'm not complaining about that. I mean, I want my oncologist to really know what he or she is doing about <clears throat> with the chemotherapy. So do your job and <clears throat> bring in other people who can help you with the supplements. <clears throat> Now, often the person with cancer is going to be the one who's going to bring it up and they, they'll be the one finding information and resources to help themselves explore supplement use. Another thing I've learned is more is not necessarily better. And just because they are natural products doesn't mean they're necessarily safe for you or safe with the chemo drugs you're using. 
And it's a lot to get through this maze and figure it out if natural products are right for you. That is meaning, are they safe and effective, accessible and affordable? So what we recommend throughout the Cancer Choices website is that people get help from someone who knows how to use supplements and off-label drugs with people with cancer. Like if you want to enhance your treatment and reduce side effects, it might be a good idea to work with an integrative oncologist who might be a medical doctor or a naturopathic oncologist, or maybe there's a really good traditional Chinese medicine practitioner who works with people with cancer and is used to working with the herbs. Uh, so there are lots of different people who could help you who would be good at this. And one of the reasons we suggest this is that we're starting to see evidence that certain natural products that have been frequently used in integrative oncology by people with cancer, these products might unknowingly actually promote the progression of cancer. And that's because some of these products give cancer cells and stem cells a survival advantage. An example would be some forms of vitamin E. In fact, Vitamin E and beta carotene are a no-no to use in people getting radiation, especially if they're smokers. Um, so, and there are other examples of that, but in people who don't have cancer, these natural products are often helpful in protecting normal cells and making them work better, but they might be particularly helpful in people with chronic illness other than cancer. But if the person has cancer, these effects are nonspecific of these natural products. They might end up increasing the efficiency, the survival advantage, and cancer-promoting signaling ability of the cells in the tumor and the cells in the environment around the tumor. So I'm going to share my screen for a moment, and, and um, yes, here we go, and show you uh, page in Cancer Choices. So in this one, how to integrate your choices, actually finding integrative oncologists and professionals. And Kira, I think I gave you the, the link, so if you would put that in the chat. So this gives you information on how to find someone who can help you. And there are several different types of uh, professionals who can help you with this. I'll let you go through the page on your own to see um, who these people are. And we tell you, we give you links on how to um, access directories and even look for people who might be in your area. So that's a resource you can use. Um, I wanted to mention that um, several organizations like the American Institute for Cancer Research, which I happen to respect, I think they do good work. And they recommend that for cancer prevention, if you're an otherwise healthy person, and if you don't have a deficiency, they don't recommend you use supplements for prevention. Um, and there's an example of this. There's this large, very large prostate cancer trial, and it was looking at vitamin E and selenium, and did they help prevent prostate cancer? And lo and behold, the vitamin E, not only did it not really prevent prostate cancer in these healthy men, but in some, it actually increased the risk of prostate cancer. So that's why we don't suggest people, you know, they hear something about vitamin E and then they decide to start taking it because it might prevent cancer. Um, so we, just a little thought there. And um, Dwight McKee, who is a medical oncologist, he's now, uh, and an integrative oncologist, he's now retired, he's an advisor to us. And uh, he made the point in an interview that if he was working with a person with cancer that was curable and the chemo, you know, had a really good chance of curing that person, he usually didn't recommend supplements uh, during that treatment phase. And he said one of the reasons is, is if the treatment didn't go well, the first thing they go to blame is, ah, you took those supplements, that's why. Um, but he does think that supplements have a real role, particularly uh, after treatment is complete. They're good for helping you build back your, your health, and they also might help in preventing recurrence. 
Um, and so there is a place for supplements and getting help is a good deal. Um, the other thing is, and you know, we've all in Cancer Choices have been pulling our hair about, out about how do you find good quality supplements? I mean, which brands do you take? How much should I take? How long? And um, so we have a great um, page, and I want to share that one with you on um, how do you find quality herbs and supplements? And I'm not going to go through everything that's on here because you can certainly look at it, but uh, you might not know that the Food and Drug Administration really uh, doesn't have much authority in terms of the safety and quality uh, and effectiveness of a supplement when it's put on the market. Uh, so it's not like a drug where they have to do all this research. And so really, it's sort of a case of innocent until proven guilty. So if a supplement gets out there and there are complaints about it causing problems, then the FDA will jump in. But otherwise, they can just sort of uh, put their product out there. And supplements uh, companies cannot make medical claims. Like they can't say this supplement is going to cure your cancer. So there is that little bit of control. Um, <clears throat> but otherwise, you know, it's sort of the wild west out there. So if you're not getting help from a healthcare professional, um, or you, you, you're going to have to do your homework, or they're going to have to do the homework to figure out which ones are safe and effective for you. <clears throat> then once you decide, well, which ones am I going to take? Um, and you're going to hear about some today and say, wow, they, they sound great. Should I take those? Uh, then you have to figure out what formulation, which one am I going to take? There's a hundred different kinds of vitamin D on the shelf here in my CVS pharmacy. So um, you have to think about some things because quality is important. It's really hard to standardize a natural product. Um, the doses and the, of the active ingredients can vary from one brand to another, or even from one batch to the other. And then you have to think about these plants and animals that, you know, it's kind of hard to control, um, you know, what's in, extracted from them, that salmon or those krill from which your omega-3 fish oils were derived don't swim in the same water twice. Are they wild or are they farmed? What about the herbs that grow in different soils? And what part of the plant did they extract from? And some products lose their potency over time, and some have way less or even none of the active ingredients listed on the label. And some might be contaminated with things that are unsafe, like heavy metals. So it can be frustrating to choose them, but Here's a few tips. Don't give up. <laughs> it's possible. Uh, so if you're working with a reputable healthcare professional and they're not really depending on selling supplements to keep their practice afloat, so uh, ask them, you know, do you know of some good brands to use, uh, some good formulations? Uh, I see a functional medicine doctor and I'll often ask her, well, if you want me to take this, what he suggests, what brand. <clears throat> and she might suggest a particular brand, or she might say, well, I just want you to find one that has this many billion of this bacteria in the probiotic, that sort of thing. So you can get some ideas. <clears throat> and then on Cancer Choices, we list a number of resources to find quality supplements. And I think this bit of research that we bring to you is really valuable. Because, I mean, I myself am often looking for, um, for quality supplements. So um, I'll just bring you down here. Sorry, I hope I don't get, give you whiplash of the eyeballs moving down too quickly. But here are some companies that rate the product specifically. And then um, here are some uh, other companies. Some you have to pay for a subscription, some you don't. But they'll um, look up, sometimes they can even look up your particular cancer and your, the drugs that you're on and the chemo that you're taking and check for interactions um, and recommend uh, uh, 
good sources of supplements. So I really encourage you to check out all these resources on this, this page. And Kara, this is the same link that we just put up. So I don't think you need to put that up again. And um, so I wanted to mention uh, just lastly, some, um, some red flags and then why we don't recommend doses. Um, so we, we pretty much know that cancer choices fits in with what experts like those who wrote that article we talked about consider what makes a, a website of information about complementary therapies uh, reliable and trustworthy. But if you're looking at other websites and you're scratching your head and it's like, really, can I believe this? Um, there are some red flags to look for, like, do they, does the article say who the author is and what their qualifications are? Uh, sometimes you can't figure out who wrote it, who's sponsoring it. You don't know if they're trying to, you know, make some profit off of this. Um, or their claims aren't transparent, like they... Um, they start making these incredible claims about the product or the therapy, and they're super critical about any other approaches. Um, they push their therapy to the exclusion of others, um, and they claim their therapy can like cure cancer. So you need to be a little leery about that and see what kind of claims they're making. And do they present the evidence? I, I was looking for some information the other day and uh, through Google, <laughs> Dr. Google, and I went to the site and uh, to find the quote that I found in Google. And it sounded like a really good bit of information I'd want to pass on through Cancer Choices, and never could I find the study they were referring to. So um, I couldn't use it, and that made me suspect about the, the site. So they, they really need to cite their sources and not just testimonials. And finally, you want to see what are their financial ties um, who uh, and are they encouraging you to buy something that might not necessarily be a bad or good thing in and of itself, but um, you know just be a little leery. Even um, physicians and other resources researchers who publish articles, who paid for the study, which you know maybe the the study was about a particular product and the company that makes the product paid for the study. So just be a little um, mindful about those things. And finally, um, we talk about, you know, people say, well, how much of this supplement should I take? We're going to be talking about vitamin D. How much should I take? What do you recommend? Well, we don't give doses on cancer choices. We're not here to prescribe treatment, to recommend specific treatments or doses. But, and one of the reasons we don't give doses is because the doses of the supplements and off-label drugs, they haven't been standardized for use in cancer care quite often. And the dosage could vary depending on why you're using it. Are you using it uh, as part of uh, treatment to enhance your treatment? Are you using it to manage a side effect? Uh, and finally, doses are often based on things like your age, your weight, uh, what other supplements or medications you're taking, and other individual factors. So we don't offer dosages, uh, but we do give you sources when we have them of dosing information. Um, and the other thing to think about is how long do you take this supplement? If you're taking it on your own and nobody um, who knows what they're doing is evaluating it, monitoring, it may not be a good idea to take a supplement for that long. So those are all things to consider. And with that, I think I am done for now. <laughs> well, thank you so much. That was just an excellent summary. I don't think uh, anybody listening to that uh presentation could accuse us of going overboard on uh, promoting uh, supplements. It was uh, filled with cautions. I would observe um, that 
if we were to apply the same strictures that you've presented on supplements uh, to the practice of oncology, uh, it would be an interesting exercise. So for example, many oncologists, as a matter of course, are paid to um, uh, bring their patients to uh, clinical trials. Uh, and uh, many oncologists who are uh, part of uh, uh, cancer centers are privileged the cancer trials at their centers over cancer trials elsewhere. Uh, many oncologists are consultants uh, to uh, cancer research organizations. So I think of a fair question. You, you've, you've done a good job of presenting the, uh, the, the concerns about uh, supplements, which are very real. I wouldn't disagree with any of them. On the other hand, uh, the uh, treatments that oncologists use are uh, often, on the one hand, hold the real potential of uh, cure or uh, palliation. On the other hand, can do much more damage. Absolutely. So what I would say is, it's not an easy thing to evaluate uh, when both conventional and uh, complementary uh, therapists uh, or websites or whatever offer these things. And in both cases, many of the strictures that you mentioned apply. So That's I just right. kind, of kind of level the playing field uh, because we ask those questions about both. Yeah, I was um, many years ago, I was sitting next to the medical oncologist I worked with and he looked over and he said, you're all into the alternative therapy stuff, aren't you? And uh, I said, well, you know what, you know, if if one of these therapies really turned out to have a lot of benefit, maybe even cure cancer, would you be willing to give up? all the money you're making off the drugs that you use to recognize that this therapy that now you don't necessarily have control over is, is doing a better job. And he, he didn't answer me. So, I mean, I get what you're saying. And that's why I said, you know, some of the authors of these research studies of drugs, you know, who were they paid for, you know, paid by the drug company. And yeah, I mean, there's, I agree with you there. And supplements definitely, I think, have their place among other complementary therapies and should be considered. But I've seen where people spent lots of money on tons of them without discretion and without any help in figuring out what are the ones that are going to be the best for me. And I think that's we're now going to turn to Nancy Hepp because our 20,000 hours of research on two websites um, have created, for those who have the patience and diligence to do so, a remarkable resource for doing exactly what you suggest people do. And not only a resource for patients, but a resource for health professionals. Uh, and so, and for friends and colleagues. And we have to acknowledge that not everybody can afford or find an integrative cancer uh, doctor or a naturopath or, you know, so uh, some people just for financial reasons alone, even if they're very diligent, they are to some degree on their own. You know, that's just the truth of the matter. And so to have a website that isn't balanced for or against herb supplements or repurposed drugs and other therapies. And to have one which, by the way, highlights uh, seven healing practices. Uh, Nancy, can you put that up for just a minute so people can see our seven healing practices? I mean, we feel an immense confidence that the seven healing practices, which you don't have to buy anything, and there's an immense amount of research behind that those seven healing practices are without question beneficial uh, for your health. And we've done an immense job of, of working on those. So I just want to kind of balance this out just for a moment, the seven healing practices, and we'll just uh, scroll down so we can see them. 
There we go. Let's focus on that. You know, eating well, moving more, managing stress, sleeping well, creating a healing environment, sharing love and support, and exploring what matters now. And as our site says, you know, they reduce symptoms and side effects. They improve your body terrain. They may improve quality of life, extend life, and reduce your risk of recurrence. Most of these are supported by substantial evidence, which we detail on each of the practice pages. So um, I just thought it would be useful to balance all the cautions that you gave, both with the fact that that's true in conventional therapies also. Absolutely. The fact that these healing... Now, we are big believers immense believers that if there is a curative treatment available uh, or if there is a treatment with immense palliative capacity available that you should look at really really carefully that's our starting place Uh, and then we go into uh, what Wayne Jonas is interestingly calling whole person cancer care and we call integrative cancer care uh, which uh, Uh, Wayne Jonas, an amazing resource, uh, and uh, Donald Abrams and Keith Block and many of our integrative practitioners all believe uh, is should be standard of practice. Whole person cancer care, integrative cancer care should be standard of practice, and we're trying to contribute to that. So with that, Nancy, um, welcome, and why don't you start us off with um, an introduction to um, uh, to what you're going to present here, uh, aspirin specifically. Okay, thank you. Before I start talking about the research, I would like to offer a framing because I will be saying things like strong evidence, modest evidence, preliminary evidence, and I want people to have a good feel for why that's important. Why do we couch the results that we find in these different categories? And an analogy that occurred to me Tuesday evening as I was watching election results is that cancer research is, well, any medical research is a lot like watching election results as they unfold. Mm -hmm. So you might have your candidate, hooray, they've got a 30% lead, but oh, only 3% of the precincts have reported yet. So it's way too early to claim victory in that case. And that would be similar to our saying that, yes, there's some evidence, but it's really very weak or perhaps preliminary. In, In other words, it's far too early in the game to make a definitive call on it. As more evidence accrues, and especially bigger studies and and more uh, more people involved in them, then we move up the ladder into modest evidence, into good evidence, maybe even into strong evidence. But to be honest, there there aren't a lot of complementary therapies that have strong evidence. And so... When I say something has preliminary evidence, maybe it shows a very good effect, but it's still way too early in the game to make a call. And one difference between medical research and elections is eventually with elections, you hit 100% and you have, this is the candidate who won. In research, there's always a possibility that another study can come out and change the landscape and the understanding again. So with with that framing, I would like to say that we found with these particular complementary cancer cancer therapies, I at least was a little surprised at how good the evidence was that they had an effect not just on symptom management, which is very important, but actually on cancer outcomes, on reducing your risk of cancer or even improving your risk of survival, reducing metastasis, reducing tumor growth if you have cancer. And these are aspirin, vitamin D, and melatonin. So, Nancy, before you go on, uh, I just want to. 
because we're talking a lot, I, I want to underscore what you just said and ask you to repeat it, that these three, uh, these three uh, interventions have good to strong evidence. Is that what you said? Mostly good evidence. Good yes. evidence on what specific outcomes. Let's just, I want to drill this down. Okay, well, well, let's go. So for example, with aspirin, yeah. there is good or even strong evidence of better survival, lower metastasis um, among people with certain kinds of cancers, cancer as a whole, adenocarcinoma, bladder cancer, colorectal cancers. There's very good or strong evidence of better survival among people who use aspirin after diagnosis. And, uh, you know, Donald Abrams, one of our principal advisors, uh, and co-wrote a, a book on integrative oncology with Andrew Weil, he has a beautiful saying, uh, which fits with a lot of other things that Laura and you have both mentioned, that the absence of evidence is not the same as the evidence of absence. The absence of evidence is not the same as the evidence of absence. So with aspirin, with the range of uh, cancers that you've described, uh, with uh, cancer as a whole, adenocarcinoma, bladder or colorectal cancer, evidence of better survival and lower metastasis, that's incredible. In other words, how many of us, I didn't know this, how many of us knew that aspirin, which is over the counter, which is used for in a wide range of ways, that if you have cancer, there is good to strong evidence of better survival, lower metastasis among people with cancer as a whole, adenocarcinoma, bladder, or colorectal cancer. So I just, I just, because we're saying a lot of things and because aspirin is accessible, cheap, and so on, it seemed to me to deserve being underscored. Indeed. And, and regarding the absence of evidence, so there are some cancer types that simply are not often studied because they're rare. For example, thyroid cancer. Mm -hmm. um, and my not saying that there's evidence for effects with thyroid cancer doesn't mean it won't work. It, it could mean it simply hasn't been studied yet. Well, also, there are families of cancer that are more similar and more different. So, for example, blood cancers are are somewhat different from solid tumor cancers. So aren't there families of cancer, and I'm going to turn to Laura on this briefly, um, you know, if, uh, let's just take, let's take the evidence of uh, uh, kind of an Ornish style program of a low fat diet, exercise, uh, deep relaxation, and finding love and support, his equivalent of our healing practices. Now that, that program is helpful across a wide range of human health outcomes, right? So right. those, those are what that means is here's an intervention costing nothing except your time and energy, which is beneficial across a wide range of human health outcomes. So the question I'm I'm posing to Nancy is since there are things like that, and since on aspirin and cancer survival, you have the good to strong evidence you've described, then modest evidence of better survival on hepatobiliary tract cancer or prostate cancer, and mixed or no evidence to modest um, among other types. And uh, actually, I'm posing this question to both of you. What can we infer, if anything, from the fact that this works with one set of cancers to the potential that it's beneficial for others given the absence of evidence? I'm sort of thinking metformin is going to be a better example of that, Michael, because okay. um, I'm thinking about the cancers that are associated with obesity, for instance, 
uh, that, that's kind of, you know, you might expect if something worked, uh, you know, and, and like colorectal cancer is studied pretty well and it's associated with obesity. So you might begin to wonder, well, if it's through that mechanism it's somehow related to obesity and what that the changes it causes in metabolism, then maybe it would be effective for other cancers like that. And so I think metformin is a really good example of that. Do you agree, Nancy? Yes, um, but I, I also want to bring it back to aspirin here in that aspirin is an anti-inflammatory drug. Just and right. So we, if we look at the cancers that we know are linked to inflammation and how does aspirin interact with those? Um, and there is a, a very strong correlation among cancers that are linked to inflammation and either better survival or lower risk of those cancers among people using aspirin. Yeah, that's great, Nancy. Do you want to show that part of the, uh, the slide? Yeah. So this is the list of the cancers that we know are related to inflammation. And in green, I have marked those where we show a benefit from aspirin use. And the darker the green, the stronger the evidence. And so as I scroll down, you will see that there are some things that are not green. There's no evidence of an effect. But as I scroll down, you will see that there is substantial overlap with fairly good evidence that aspirin does uh, provide benefit among these cancer types related to inflammation. And interestingly, with brain cancer, uh, you have the blood-brain barrier, right? Mm -hmm. So that could be uh, a factor, as well as it being, if we look at the ones bladder, breast, uh, colorectal, esophageal, uh, 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 head and neck, interesting that there isn't one, uh, liver, uh, lung, uh, but lymph, again, is a different kind of cancer. So it, it does seem, uh, and then pancreas and prostate and stomach. So it does seem to not only uh, uh, an, uh, the anti-inflammatory dimension, but it's just interesting the types of cancer that have a familial resemblance there. Uh, that and the the ones with no effect, there are reasons it seems why it might not uh, be effective. And again, we're talking about. Anyway, that was my point. Comments on that, Nancy? Do you think I've got that right or wrong? I, I think you're right. And I, I, I think that it's important at this stage to look at those commonalities. Well, yeah. What might be the, the same across the types of cancer that show benefit here? So let's go on from aspirin. What's our next case study here? Um, vitamin D. Very yeah. interesting. Extremely. Um, so when I started digging deep into vitamin D research, I had to scratch my head quite a lot because there are different doses. Some studies look at your serum levels, some at whether you're taking supplements or not. Um, some have different definitions of deficiency and sufficiency, and, and it was it was all over the place. And so we had to really dig down and come up with some similar definition, definitions and categories. Um, then I discovered that two very different measures of serum levels, blood levels of vitamin D were being used, and they were off by a factor of two and a half. And so I had to bring those numbers into alignment too. And what we found was that for the most, well, there's very good evidence that if you are deficient in vitamin D, you have a higher risk of cancer and of poor outcomes after diagnosis. Let's so just hold on that point for a minute. There's good evidence that if you are deficient, there's good evidence of higher risk, mortality, and recurrence. Is that yes. right? Yes. Okay. Yes. Just wanted to underscore that. Thanks. Um, of many cancer types. Yeah. 
So a deficiency is a, a, a vitamin D because of course your body produces vitamin D naturally in response to exposure to sunlight. And uh, there, there's also some dietary intake of vitamin D, but generally not enough. So if you are deficient in vitamin D, that's something that you would want to address uh, uh, in, in regards to cancer. So uh, do, do, does taking supplements bring your blood levels up? Yes. Yes, there is, is a mounting evidence for that. Does taking supplements reduce your risk and improve your outcomes? That depends. That depends on if you're deficient in the first place. If you are deficient, taking vitamin D supplements, yes, there's good evidence or, or at least modest evidence for, for many cancer types that that will help. Taking supplements will help if you are deficient. If you're not deficient, if you have sufficient vitamin D levels, taking supplements aren't gonna help much. And in fact, if you take a lot of supplements and you weren't deficient, it could take you up into a danger zone. So finding out your baseline uh, vitamin D level and then getting it checked periodically would be really important in deciding whether or not to take supplements and at what dose. How expensive is the vitamin D uh, assay? Does anybody know, Laura, do you know? Uh, you're on mute, Laura. I don't know, Michael, but I do know that at least it's been covered under my health insurance, which is not the, the best of plans. And I'm pretty sure it would be covered. So when you have your physical Usually a vitamin D test does not cost any more than your other lab work. And uh, Nancy, uh, do we know whether as, as an alternative or an adjunct, if you have low vitamin D levels, uh, what's the benefit of, of getting out in the sun and, and just sunlight? Oh, it's, it, that is a way to do it. You don't need supplements at all if you have access to sunlight. Right. And there isn't some other reason why you shouldn't be in sunlight. For example, what about sun lamps? lamps? If you don't have access to sunlight, what about sun lamps? Do we know how they work with vitamin D levels? I don't. That would be an interesting question. Yeah, I'm looking it up. <laughs> yeah. Okay. We're just we'll pose that to ourselves. Right. You know, listen, friends. This is you're getting a view of how we work together. So, <laughs> yeah. So wonderful, Nancy. Is that, what more would you add on? I mean, let me let me point this out. I don't think any other site has gone to the length that you've gone to on vitamin D and discovered this point about how, you know, if you're deficient, it can be really helpful uh, for a significant number of cancers. But if you're not deficient, not. And if you take too much, it can even be dangerous. And I, I would challenge people who look at the other sites to find another site that has done that depth of evaluation. So extraordinary work, Nancy. So is so, there more on that or shall we go yeah, on? Yeah, I wanna make a couple of other points about yeah. vitamin D. Um, one is people with very pale skin produce vitamin D from sunlight pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. And the darker your skin is, the, the longer you need to be exposed to direct sunlight. Mm -hmm. um, so for someone like me, I'm very pale skin, uh, perhaps 15 or 20 minutes at midday um, mm -hmm. during the, the stronger sun months would, would be plenty. Maybe even only five days a week would be mm -hmm. plenty to, to bring me up to sufficiency. So for someone with very dark skin, it could be two hours or longer. Mm -hmm. But uh, you are able to produce. Um, also, the the intensity of the sun makes a big difference. So, um, if you live closer to the equator, then you are getting much stronger sun. And the further away from the equator that you live, the the lower in, the angle in the sky of the sun, and the less direct sunlight. And a rule of thumb is if your shadow is shorter than you are at any time of day or time of year, then you are producing vitamin D. 
What but a cool if, fact. Yeah, if, you're, if your shadow is longer than you are, either because it's early morning or late in the evening or December, uh, then you are probably not producing any vitamin D worth noting. I didn't know that, and it's such a cool fact. It's, <laughs> if your shadow is shorter than you are, you're getting your D. If not, you're not. Right. That, that's, that's a rule of thumb. A rule of thumb. Rule of thumbs are great. Now, uh, what about um, the effect of vitamin D on side effects and symptoms? Ah, very good point. Um, so there's some evidence, modest evidence, I, again, too far out to call definitively, but, <laughs> but mounting evidence of less peripheral neuropathy and less pain during hormone therapy. So those, those are very uncomfortable side effects and they can last a long time. So if vitamin D can assist with those, um, and that, that could be very helpful. <clears throat> and yeah. Another thing related to that is vitamin D is related to lower inflammation, which again refers back to that chart I shared a few minutes ago about the impacts of inflammation on different cancer types. And inflammation also contributes to pain and neuropathy. Yeah, and I'm reading off your little uh, 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 research thing here, preliminary evidence of better muscle function of people with prostate cancer, less loss of bone mineral density during hormone therapy. That's a big deal. <clears throat> Fatigue during advanced cancer, less oral mucositis, which is a real drag during radiotherapy, less pain and less vaginal atrophy during tamoxifen treatment. So that's a big deal. Now, those are that's preliminary evidence. But here's an interesting question. Um, if you're not getting up into the range, which is uh, toxicity and overdose is very high levels, right? So this is preliminary evidence. <clears throat> Goodness, uh, you know, how great is the risk as opposed to the potential benefit, even though the evidence is only preliminary, for people with these conditions of including vitamin D in their supplements? So well, it's a weighing of risk and benefit. Okay. Yes, it, it's a weighing of risk and benefit. And just, by the way, a lot of these um, side effects that you mentioned relate to hormone uh, balances in your body. And vitamin D is actually a hormone as it's right. processed and produced in your body. So, so there's likely a, a very strong hormone element to this also. Uh, and um, when so you take vitamin D... Does your body tend to shut down on its own production of vitamin D? Uh, D? Oh. No, if you were to stay in, uh, I'm assuming, if you were to stay in direct sunlight for hours in a day, your body would keep producing. I don't know that you can get up into toxic levels from your from sunlight production. I'm, I'm not sure about that, but it seems unlikely. Great. But so, as for the risk benefit, yeah. if you know some people think, oh, if I take 800 IUs a day, then 8,000 would be better and 80,000 could be even better. And so as Laura pointed out in her uh, spiel a little while ago, more is not always better. So the recommended dose is 800 IUs, but that depends on your age. Um, it, going over 5,000 would always, to me, indicate you need some professional oversight to make sure you're not getting too high. Some people um, in some studies were taking 50,000 IUs a day, and they were running into toxicity. But the 5,000 level, uh, uh, the supplements that I see, a lot of them are, are at the 5,000 level. Uh, so uh, uh, at that level, uh, we don't see evidence of harm. Is that correct? Not acute toxicity, no. But if, if you were to take that, uh, you could get up above optimal levels, certainly. And But if you were getting blood tests, then you would know it if you were getting too high. Yes. Yep. 
Okay. Well, again, this is an extraordinary piece of research that to our knowledge, nobody else has up on the web, that vitamin D can be truly beneficial. Uh, there's all kinds of evidence of various levels of its value. But uh, if you don't have a deficiency, it's not necessarily useful. And therefore, here's a situation where it's really useful to get it done. I wonder if there are home vitamin D kits that are reliable. Do you know that, Laura? I just saw that there are home vitamin D kits, but I didn't have a chance to see if they are reliable. These the, They were coming up as ads when I was looking up the cost. But um, the cost isn't much, by the way. It's looking like about thirteen dollars. Oh, that's nothing. Now, if you have to, if that's the only test you're getting, it'll probably cost more because they have to charge you to, you know, yeah. do the vena puncture and all that. Wonderful. So, Nancy, let's go on to one of our stars, melatonin. Right. Uh, one thing that really surprised me was that there is very good evidence. We we consider it strong evidence of better survival, better tumor response, and remission among people with solid tumors who use melatonin along with conventional treatments. There's not much evidence that it works on its own, but it does seem to enhance the effects of other conventional treatments. So let's go on. Okay. Um, there is lower, so, so melatonin is also, uh, produced in your body. Naturally, your, your pineal gland produces it and it has strong associations and even regulates your sleep and wakefulness cycle. So your levels of melatonin vary every day. So generally in the evening, as the, the light is fading, your levels of melatonin will ramp up and prepare you for sleep and bring on sleepiness. And then in the morning, if you're fortunate and you're exposed to bright light, the melatonin levels will go down and other daily hormone levels will go up. And that is a healthy uh, rhythm to have higher melatonin in the evening and then lowered in the day and during the day uh, because it, it relates to your sleep and wake. And so it, this relates to your ability to get good sleep. That's melatonin is um, in the US, it's sold over the counter. You can just go buy it and you can take some. Um, I know people who use it when they're traveling because sometimes they get jet lag and, and melatonin promotes sleepiness and allows you to fall asleep easier. Um, it, it impacts inflammation and oxidation. It uh, again has hormone related effects because it is a hormone itself. So there's, there's modest to good evidence that it can be very helpful. Um, it's such an interesting thing. I, I actually, um, I'll venture into personal anecdote here. I, I take melatonin at night for sleep, as many people do. Um, but then I read in different places um, that you can become dependent on melatonin supplementation. And there was even one controversy about whether uh, people were experiencing more uh, memory issues while they if they took melatonin all the time. And that that hasn't been resolved, uh, but uh, it, there's no strong evidence uh, on it. But um, what about the question, if people use it regularly, people like me, uh, does one potentially develop a dependence? Laura, do you know about that? Well, you, Michael, I think you're talking maybe about what was raised in that New York Times article. Yeah. Uh, can you become addicted to melatonin? And I think one of the points they made was it's not so much that you are physically dependent on it, but uh, people come to think it's helping me sleep 
And therefore, if I don't, don't take it, it's not going to work. And I, I get that <laughs> when I've had issues with sleeping. So um, it's not so much the physical dependence. And, and I would say, um, you know, a lot of the issues we have is from being on computer screens or watching TV in that blue range of light, um, it's going to stop your body from beginning to make the, re release the melatonin. And so if you're on your smartphone reading or your computer screen or watching TV, uh, when the melatonin would normally be rising, um, th that would be one solution to letting your body release the optimal amount I um, mean, it would make sense if you're taking a hormone, like if you take prednisone, you can't go off of it cold turkey because your therm your thermostat needs to uh, realize that, hey, I need to start making prednisone again, and I can't do it fast enough if you just stop it cold turkey. And maybe that would happen if you've been taking melatonin and your body was depending on that outside source. Um but I, I think some just some good sleep hygiene would would help uh, to maximize your melatonin production. Mm -hmm. And I, I was interested, Nancy. A lot of the effects you've mentioned about um, these supplements, when it comes the rubber meets the road, I think it's really the way they affect your body's terrain factors. All of them, you know, relate to inflammation, hormonal balance, uh, insulin and balance and inflammation. Um, I think that's a commonality between the three of these that we're seeing, that they affect your the body terrain. That's probably a commonality with most complementary therapies and certainly with the seven healing practices. Mm -hmm. So, yes, improving your internal terrain that relates to your nutritional status, your inflammation, your blood sugar levels, all and, and many other things um, just leads to better outcomes all around. You know, Liz Fleming uh, sent two good notes that one was the Center for Science and the Public Interest has a newsletter, Nutrition Action, which is an excellent newsletter. But then she said the November 2022 issue, Supplement Risk, gives quality assurance seals, USP, NSF, and Consumer Lab. Uh, Laura, are those all uh, 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 assurance seals that you... Uh, yeah, say the first one. Uh, USP, NSF, oh, yeah. and yes. Consumer Lab. Yes, we list all those and more. But I love that newsletter, by the way, and I'm glad you brought it up. It's a quick you know, study on research every month. It's great. Right. And Consumer Lab, you have to subscribe to, right? Right. But the, is that a good it, source? It is, but I don't necessarily find it that user-friendly. Um, um, and same with um, Natural Medicine's database. I mean, it, it, great information in there, but it, it takes a little bit to figure it out. Um, so we have listed some others that kind of bring it to a more practical level. Isn't it true that Canada has higher standards for supplements than the U.S.? At least I've been told that. Do you know that? I've been told that, too. Yeah, because uh, I've had uh, actually a very knowledgeable uh, 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 supplement store in Langley on Whitby Island, uh, the woman there uh, stocks some uh, Canadian supplements precisely because of the what she claims to be the higher standards. And we should actually look into that, because if that's true, uh, it would be another thing. I mean, this thing that we've talked about, about why we don't recommend brands, you know, it's really challenging because you know, we tell people, well, we don't recommend this, but we tell you where to go to get the dosages. Okay, fair enough. We know why we don't do that, but it's hard for people to go and get that. And then with brands, um, uh, you know, it's a similar thing. One of the sites that we use, and we've been in touch with them, and I'm not promoting it, but I am informing you, is that there's a site called Wellcasa, W-E-L-L-K-A-S-A, 
run by a very interesting guy. And uh, his business model is that um, you can use it free. Uh, and uh, he does uh, have, you know, good, solid uh, research, not as deep as ours, but solid on the different supplements. But then he gives you a whole set of supplement brands that uh, uh, that have been uh, reviewed uh, uh, that you can buy directly from them. Or for that matter, you could go to a, a health food store and buy them there. I mean, I must say that I, and this, I'm just talking for myself, uh, you know, but I, I find that going to uh, a Whole Foods market, for example, is likely to give me a set of supplements that I'm more inclined to think uh, well of than if I go to a CVS or something like that. So again, we're surrounded by reasons that make us exceedingly cautious. And that prevents us from giving people what they really want which is simple guides so that they don't have to become experts. So I think our research is extraordinary in its depth, but then we need to help people get to the shortcuts in some way. And we do that, but I hope we continue to explore deepening our capacity to guide people toward shortcuts that do what we're not willing to do. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that makes sense, but yeah. well, by the way, we do mention well casa uh, yeah, in the yeah. list of yeah. So um, you have to dig down to find it, you know. And I'm raising it up on this uh, on this webinar. Well, start. we actually raised it up yesterday, Michael. All I right. didn't see it on a page. I wanted it on. All right. So yeah, yeah. Uh, Nancy, anything else you want to uh, mention on uh, uh, melatonin? Well, um, yes, I just found out a couple of weeks ago that melatonin uh, requires a prescription in Europe and perhaps in Canada and several other countries. And and I was quite stunned by that because the wow. safety profile that I have discovered is is quite safe. Um, but apparently the regulatory agencies there have some concerns about safety that say it requires a prescription and oversight by a physician. Uh, we do have a warning. Melatonin, because it promotes sleepiness, can definitely interfere with and uh, enhance anesthesia. So if you're getting ready to go into surgery, um, you will definitely want to let your surgeon know if you're using melatonin and even uh, stop using five to seven days before your surgery um, as, because people who use it either um, may come out of anesthesia more slowly or may have some complications as a result of that. Wonderful. I think this might be a good point, Laura, for us to ask uh, Lindsay McDonald to join us. Uh, yeah, Lindsay is um, a thriver, as she says, um, and she is one of our volunteer site guides, and she is also an advisor to our outreach committee. And we just spoke at the GRIT uh, cancer conference last week, and she did such a good job explaining how she spoke with her uh, her medical oncologist about her interest in uh, complementary therapies, including uh, taking supplements. And sometimes, you know, it's a real turnoff. You 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 want to talk to your oncologist about this, and they. Um, say, why do you want to do that? Or no, it's not safe. Or, oh, well, it's naturally it can't hurt you. So clearly they're not really um, super supportive or understanding of, you know, the value of them. And so I just thought Lindsay could give a few tips on how to talk to your oncologist about that. Lindsay, Hi, Lindsay. Welcome. Lindsay welcome. It's so lovely to see you. Lovely to see you too, Michael. Um, so one of the things that I learned over the past nine years is that when I am approaching, let me give you a, a background. I fully believe everything that we just said, that sometimes 
supplements can actually hurt you and potentiate your treatment in a bad way. Um, and as a result, any time that I put something new into my body, because I am still on treatment, um, I'm on oral chemo and a PARP inhibitor and uh, different things, I always talk to my oncologist and I ask them if they can run it through the part of their hospital that checks interactions. And that is hugely important because a lot of people want to just jump on, for lack of a better word, the bandwagon of supplements without really checking it out. One of the things I've done is I have become pretty competent in knowing about the cancer that I deal with. And so when I'm talking to doctors, I am coming from a place of evidence-based research. And sometimes I am bringing with me those articles so that we can have a discussion and they don't think I'm just pulling something that I heard about. Um, and that has made a huge difference. My oncologist, I wouldn't say is an integrative oncologist, but we have come up with a deal that if it is not going to hurt me and that is doing the research, then she will allow it. And one of the things that we do after that is we monitor it. Because as, as Nancy was talking about, you know, you can get to a level of toxicity. And I think it's very important that you have agreed on a way to monitor this so, so that you don't get harmed. Great, Lindsay. So you, this is, um, you've done this through your own research and working with your conventional oncologist. That's great. Which is really interesting. Yeah. Lindsay, I I don't, Lindsay, you and I haven't had a chance to chat before we start, but is there any dimension of your overall story that you'd be comfortable sharing? Because it's remarkable, and I think it would give people a real sense of hope. Um, so do you remember my story, Michael? Because you can I ask do, me, I do. Ask me the questions, I will answer any of them. All right. Uh, what kind of cancer do you have? I have two cancers now. I have metastatic breast and I have CML, leukemia. And how long have you been living with metastatic breast cancer? Nine years. And you've and done a lot of things. You went to Europe for treatment. Uh, you've done a lot of stuff. Yeah. So what happened was all of the medicines, the natural protocols, when I say natural, I mean the things hospitals do, not natural products, um, didn't work. Yeah. Should have worked. In fact, I was told they would work, but they didn't. And so I had to start looking outside. As they were prescribing me new treatments, I sort of had to have a plan B. And um, one of the new treatments that they put me on accelerated my cancer really fast. So they wanted to put me on a third one, which I was fine with, fine with, but I had to be able to have a plan B. And when plan B presented itself, which was going to Vienna for treatment and doing hypothermia, uh, hyperthermia, where they heated up my body to get rid of the cancer. Um, I was lucky in that doctor in Vienna would let me stay on what I was doing in the United States at the same time. And that sort of comforted everybody, the conventional oncologist, the people in Vienna, me, um, and the combinations that I have experienced have kept me beautifully alive. And yes, I still have cancer literally everywhere in my body and it is perfectly stable. And the biggest thing that I find is that keeping my stress level, which is one of our seven healing practices to do things that keep my stress level 
far away from me and very low has really made a difference because stress in itself can really harm your cells and your inflammation. And I had to learn how to do that. Yeah, so it's I mean, a combination. I th the reason I think it's so beautiful to talk with you is, you know, because we want to do everything right, which I deeply believe in, you know, as Laura opened it up, we have 10,000 qualifications. We have all the concerns, you know, we're based, we're deeply evidence-based and, and we want to be all those things. At the same time, when you talk to a, a thriver survivor like yourself, you are making uh, decisions uh, based on a combination of your deepest possible research, but also your intuitions about what's yeah. going to work for you. And, you know, I think that's immensely important. I, I have found that that is the best way for me to do yeah. things. And also, your intuition is your intuition. And if you grow that intuition, even better. Because the reality is, with any of these treatments, wh whether we're going outside of conventional care, every single person is different. And I could be sitting next to somebody with exactly the same diagnosis. And those things will work differently on each person because of what their body is made of, what they've been through. So you really have to, you have to keep your curiosity alive while you're dealing with this let's say journey, because in doing that, it takes you away from fear and it lets you really sort of be free in your thinking and listening to yourself as to what's the best things for you. And I think taking you away from your fear is such a critical thing. I was having a conversation with Wayne Jonas, MD, who's we're doing the webinar with next. And by the way, I would not miss Wayne Jonas for anything. And he talks a lot, as did Dwight McKee, about really, uh, uh, really dealing with fear uh, and the toxicity of fear and what are the strategies that enable people to go beyond fear. And they're all different kinds of strategies. So people of deep religious or spiritual faith, for example, they can have an immense capacity to overcome fear. Uh, you know, uh, but what are the different, what is your strategy for overcoming fear, Lindsay? So my strategy is I know that when I am centered and nourished inside, that I have the ability to see clear through. And so what I do is I get rid of the things that stress me out and I build the things that nourish me so that I can get to homeostasis. And when I am in homeostasis, I have the power back to see through the fear and to know that this is a project for me. This is a project, I've done plenty of other projects. I look at this as a project and say, what are the skills I used? How am I gonna do this project? And somehow separating it from cancer that's affecting me to this is a project, helps me get through the fear tremendously well. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I just want to, we're getting close to the close, but the other day uh, we were talking about this webinar and um, and what, uh, talking with uh, our colleague, Mickey Scheidel, our creative director, uh, about which uh, supplements we were gonna review next, because Nancy, remind us of how many hours it takes to do a typical supplement. Uh, on average, about 100 hours of work Let's to create one that, therapy review. Yeah, it's an incredible process that uh, Nancy and Laura do. And so I, I was saying to them, yeah, we do all this work, and I want to make a list of the things about going beyond the evidence. And I made this little list, which is in no particular order. The first we've all already mentioned, the absence of evidence is not the evidence of absence of an effect. The second, also from Donald Abrams, 
the lower the evidence of harm, the lower the burden of proof. The third, from Wayne, uh, Wayne Jonas, Wayne talks about the house of evidence as opposed to the hierarchy of evidence that privileges randomized contr uh, controlled trials and therefore pharmaceuticals. In other words, so much of the impact of a pharmaceutical is related to the placebo effect. And in order to weed out the placebo effect, you have to do the RCTs. But the point that Wayne makes is that whatever the intervention, the ritual itself is a very substantial part of the impact, which is what we call, quote, the placebo. But the placebo sounds like, an, you know, oh, it's just the placebo. Actually, it's the self-healing capacities of the body, you know? And, and Wayne really understands that. There's a book called N of One, which is a book about what happens to a single individual which is exactly what you're doing, Lindsay, you know, what happens to the individual? What benefits them? And going back to Wayne, 80% of health outcomes are non-medical, that is lifestyle, genetics, environment, and so forth. And then on the interventions, the medical therapeutic conventions, 80% of the benefit is the, the, the ritual or mm -hmm. self-healing. So, I love the fact and am do totally dedicated to our incredible amount of work on the evidence, which is what we've got every time we do 100 hours to put up a new supplement with our new methodology. And Nancy, I'd actually like to ask you to put up the uh, for one of them just all the different categories of uh, ways that uh, we... we uh, evaluate uh, each therapy, which you had up briefly before, but I'd like people to see it at the end. I love the fact that we do that, but I want to balance that with all the reasons that for a patient to pay attention to our intuition, uh, to health promotion, to the seven healing practices and everything else. And that if there's, as you said, Lindsay, if there's not evidence of harm, if it's not going to hurt you, then what it can do, because your intuition tells you to do it, it can release the self-healing placebo impact. Yep. And that is an immensely powerful thing to do. So Nancy, can you just take us to one of the uh, ones where people can see all the different uh, parts that where we evaluate the different types of effect? You know, in other words, on the cancer itself and on side effects and everything else. There we go. Yeah, melatonin will do it. Yeah. So, uh, you know, five is the highest ranking. And, you know, and melatonin gets a five on improving treatment outcomes, a four on optimizing your body terrain a five on managing side effects and promoting wellness, a four on reducing cancer risk, a four on its use by integrative oncology experts, which is a critical one because they often are seeing good results or something or intuitively believe in it, a four on safety and a four on affordability and access. So we're doing, we've now done this with what, 30 therapies, Nancy? Yes, we've done 30 therapies and we have another two uh, ready to go up. And what are the new ones coming out? Uh, the Gerson regimen and metformin. Wow. Gerson and metformin. Fantastic. Well, we are two minutes before the hour, and I just want to thank Nancy and Laura and Lindsay and our team, uh, Kira Epstein and Ken, our. Um, tech uh, guru. And uh, I've really enjoyed this. I think it's given uh, our, our community of people a real sense of what goes into the 20,000 hours of work that we've done on beyond conventional cancer therapies and now cancer choices. And the work is far from over. So uh, we are committed to uh, as um, Nikki Scheidel says, we climbed one mountain and now we're climbing the next one. So thank you all. And uh, 
Kira, over to you. I know you're going to announce our next webinar again. Thank you, Michael, and, and Laura and Nancy. It's a great conversation. And if you want to rewatch or re listen or share it with folks, again, we will have this. Uh, rec the recordings will be posted and they'll be on the new school website, the Cancer Choices uh, website, and on our feeds on SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or YouTube. The next Cancer Choices slash new school webinar will be on December 8th, and that is with Dr. Wayne Jonas. So thanks for being with us at the new school, and we'll see you next time. Thank you all. And by the way, as you leave, consider donating to Cancer Choices. We could really use your help. So, um, yeah, thank you for being with us. Don't take it, don't, don't, don't. Don't take it, don't, don't, don't. Don't take it, don't, 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 don't. Don't take it, 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 don't, don't, don't. The river is a healer. The river is a saint. The river knows no 